Hi friends and welcome back to my channel. My name is Tammy Ernest and I am a long arm quilter. And here on my channel, I like to share customer finishes as well as my own personal projects. So I am so glad you're here with me today, especially if you're new, welcome in. And um, so today I have, I want to show you some um, design boards that I've been making and also an update on my So Scrappy Spools. I'm so excited. And then I have uh, lots of customer finishes to share with you today as well. So we're just a couple days before Thanksgiving here in the U.S. and um, we've already got family in so you may hear some noise in the background a little more than usual. Got a few more people in the house today than I normally do um, but it's exciting. I hope you have plenty to be thankful for in your life this year and um, it's been a lot of fun to have new ones in the house and um, my son's home from college which is always exciting as well and we'll be getting together um, our whole clan will be getting together in a couple days and then our extended family as well so um, really a lot to be thankful for it is a very windy day today <laughs> a little blustery outside so I've got some wind chimes on the porch you may hear those go as well just a little background noise to fill in behind me today so I've been working on some design boards I think I don't know if I mentioned this or not, but um, if you follow follow Lori Holt at all, you know that she always um, has design boards. That's what she puts her blocks on. And you can think of design boards as, um, you know, a lot of people will have a, uh, a design wall in their studio where they can uh, audition blocks and things like this. So a design board is really just a miniature design wall. It's portable, um, comes in different sizes, and Lori Holt sells, I mean, she originally made her own, but now um, now has those produced and you can buy those ready-made ones. But on her um, YouTube channel many years ago, uh, she did a tutorial where she taught how to, to make these. And I think mine aren't pretty they're not they're not perfect let's just say it that way they're not perfect you know you can buy perfect ones <laughs> uh, but my goal in doing this is one to help me keep my blocks straight when I'm working on projects and I'll kind of explain how I do that in just a minute but also to use up things that I have in my sewing room that I can use for another purpose and these design boards are just that so the ones I've made um, I'll just show you a couple. I've made diff different sizes. This one's probably a six inch square and it has flannel, not flannel. This is batting on one side and it's just the foam core board on the other. And then um, I surround it with leftover binding and I'll kind of show you a little bit more about that in just a minute. And then I made some larger ones too. And I have I've got others, but I just brought these as samples because I'm sure you didn't want to see everything I've made. These are um, 12 inch squares. Now, when you buy them through Fat Quarter Shop or your favorite uh, quilt store, um, Lori does them in several different sizes. I really don't know. I've never bought any of the ones that she um, has done because I just think this is a great idea to do on my own. So to start with for design boards, this is how I do it. You can do it different ways. This is the process that works well for me. Um, a foam, foam core board, you can buy this at Walmart, at Joanne Fabrics. Um, you can purchase it online, I'm sure. And it's just um, foam core board. I don't know. I don't know. People use it for posters or for... It's not poster board. It's not the real thin, flimsy one. This is a, a heavier duty one. Um, I'm not sure. You know, this is the kind of the same thing that they use for make, to make science fair projects, but you can buy those in three folds. I don't buy them in a three fold. I buy them in a sheet. Usually it's like 24 by 36 or 20 by 30. I don't know, some dimension like that. So you need that. The other thing that I use is leftover batting. So if you're like me, you have lots of little scraps of batting like this. Usually, you know, when you're finishing a quilt and you've for me, when I've cut a piece of batting and I may have a 12 inch piece at the very bottom. Now, if you buy your batting from me when you have me do your quilts, you are only paying for the amount of batting that I need for your quilt. Um, so let's say your quilt comes in at 80 by 80. I would need a piece of batting 88 by 88 and I will cut that off of my roll. Now my roll, I usually have queen rolls. I also have king rolls, but usually I have queen rolls and queen rolls come around 93 inches. And so, um, I only charge you for the 88 by 88 and I keep all the leftover batting that's left over. Um, but at the end of that, so I would cut it 
88 wide, but my roll is 93 wide, long, however you want to do that. <laughs> so I have some extra inches there. In that case, what I would have only five inches left. So that may be enough to make a little board like this. But obviously you can see if it's a, it's a quilt that may be only 60 by 70, um, I would still have a lot left over. So you are not buying that batting. That is, I only charge you for the amount of batting I actually use on your quilt, which is a great advantage for you because if you're sending um, a batting to me, then you've got to buy a packaged batting or maybe you purchase your own rolls. That would be an option too. But you're sending me a packaged batting. I return all of the scraps from any batting that you send to me, um, but you may have some extras too. And then you could make these design boards as well. So I do have um, strips of batting left. A lot of time, you know, sometimes those are large enough for, um, you know, a table runner or something. I always have good intentions. I don't end up using a lot of them. I have in the past joined them, and maybe I'll talk about that on another video where you can join batting pieces together. You can do that and use that in your quilts as well. But another great option to use that leftover batting is to make design boards. So I start out by cutting my um, foam core board into whatever sizes. It doesn't have to be standard because these are just me. So I get as many out of one piece of foam core board that I can. So if I need some big 12 by 12 pieces, then I'll cut several 12 by 12s out of that. It's not the most economical, how does that work? So if I'm doing a 12 by 12, I would have to go back and look at the sizes. Um, not that it's the, not the most economical, but if I do 12, I'm only getting a couple out of each board. Maybe they're 20 by 36. I don't know because if they were 24 by 36, I should technically be able to get six out of them. And I know I can't get six 12 inch boards out of one of those pieces. So I'll do some research. I don't know. Um, I also had some foam, some foam core board left over in my studio because I had tried to make a design board. My, If you've seen my video where I tour my sewing room, I don't have room for a design wall, but I tried to make one in our hallway one time. And the way I did it was I just joined like six big pieces of foam core board together with duct tape and then I covered it with batting and I put it on the wall. I never used it because the hallway is skinny. I could never get far enough away from the design wall to even tell whether the, <laughs> the project I was putting together really looked good or not. So it just, it didn't happen. And I eventually took it down. So I was using those leftover pieces from that. Today what I do is I lay out a quilt on the floor. It's just easier for me that way. Uh, maybe someday it'll be different and I can um, have a bigger room, but that's what I'm working in right now and I'm going to use it. So um, so I was using some leftover pieces that I had. So I don't know. I didn't buy them to be able to tell you what size they are. Anyway, so if I need some 12 inch ones, I'll do some 12 inch ones. And then let's say I have a strip left. Maybe I can get some eight inch boards out of those. Um, nothing says that you have to make them square either. It could be that you make them rectangle. Actually, I had one of the members in my quilt circle say that she kept, um, you know, the cardboard that comes into a, in a bolt, at, you know, in the middle of a bolt. So say you buy a bolt of fabric and you use all that up and you have that cardboard piece in the middle. She actually, I don't know if she covered it, but she talked about how it was a perfect size for laying out blocks. It would be best to put some, some flannel or some batting on top of that because your fabric's stick to that and it's a lot easier to move them that way without having things fly off as you're walking but what a great idea you know you've you've got a good 22 inches 20 inches maybe 24 because it sticks out on either side of the of the bolt and that whole thing you could line up several there so that's an option too anyway I cut as many boards as I can out of a piece even going down to really small ones because I can use those in my cross stitch bags um, to catch little small threads as I'm sewing, I can stick those on there instead of just having them on the corner of the couch and then forgetting about them. My next thing that I do then is I um, take, I just use some Elmer's craft glue and I go here, let me, let's pretend that this was one of the boards. I will just go around all the edges with this stick glue. I will lay those gluey edges down on top of the batting that I'm using. And then I will take, with a mat underneath, I will take my rotary cutter and just an old rotary cutter. Don't use the one that you use normally for your fabric, but 
and I will just trim around those edges. That usually, I'm not going all over the board, I'm only going the edges of the board, and that usually keeps the batting on there fine. Then for my, um, the outside edges, I just, you could use them like this, honestly. Nothing says that you have to finish them with a, with a pretty edge. I just like pretty things, so I do finish mine. What I use for my edges is leftover binding. So when I finish a quilt and I have binding left over, I usually roll it up into a cute little bun like this and I tack it with a little pin and I have these all different sizes set up on I have an antique sewing machine in my sewing space and I just stack these up. I think they're really cute. But at some point you need to use them, right? So here's one that's very scrappy. Um, and I would bet just looking at the middle of that, that that green is not attached to that blue would be my guess. I don't want to unroll it right now. I know I did a scrappy binding on something, but this may not all be attached. I may have just rolled it up together, meaning all of these strips may not be connected end to end, but a lot of them are. So this would cover a lot of boards. Um, obviously for smaller boards, I could use a smaller little bun that I have and do as many as I can. If I'm doing a larger one, you do want to have a continuous strip for ease of sake, you know, um, a continuous strip to do all the way around. So what I do at this point, because um, I want all these to be finished edges, I don't want any raw edges. I'll come back to that in a second. <laughs> so um, what I take, this is two and a half inch binding strips. I actually um, will fold these over and press them so that the raw seams are in the middle. I will press that. And then that is what is going around the edge here. I use hot glue gun to glue all that down. I have tried to craft glue. I have tried some other glues. One, it doesn't dry right away. So I feel like, um, I'm trying to do these in a hurry. I don't know. Um, it didn't stick real well. And because this, or I had another liquid glue I was trying, because it doesn't dry right away, I, don't, I may not know until a half hour later that it really didn't stick, and then I've got to go back and finish that board. I want to be done with this. So um, so I have gone back to the, to the glue gun. It's a little messy. I'm getting better at it. If I did it more often, I would be even better at it, but it's going to take some practice. But again, I'm not selling these. I'm not doing these for anybody else's use but my own. So, um, so it works. It works. I do both sides. I go around and do one side and um, then I move and then do the inside of this one. So Lori has a tutorial. Hers is much cleaner, much nicer than mine. And you can go watch that. But that's just my basics on how I do my design boards. A great use for leftover um, batting and binding and they're real cute. And you can lay out your blocks on these. Um, one of the things I was doing um, a couple weeks ago is I was working on a client quilt and again because my sewing space isn't large enough to have everything laid out in my sewing space I actually had a quilt laid out in um, one of the bedrooms and so I would go down to that bedroom and I would pick up a couple blocks that I would need and this is kind of why I was making some more of these because I didn't have enough at the time but I would lay out the blocks that I needed and you can stack them up then, and then I would carry these into my sewing space, and I would do the sewing on them, and then take them back, lay them out, and make sure, because this was a quilt that had to make sure that I had everything in the right place. And that way, um, I could have them all stacked up in order and just do one after the other, and then take them back in and set them down. So that was a really handy way. Um, what did I say that... Uh, I said remind me of something in just a minute. Oh, um, I said that I don't like a raw edge on here. I did a binding one time. It was actually, I can't remember. I was going to say what it was. I think it was a Camille Ross Gelly pattern that was in one of her books where she showed a raw edge binding, and it was really cute. And I did that on a couple of quilts, um, and I had some binding left over. So it was a little thinner than this, but it was a raw edge, and I actually just put it over the edge and hot glued it down just like that. And I've never had a problem. I should have brought that board down to show you. I've never had a problem 
with anything with that one too. So you could go, you could get more, I guess. Um, and just, you know, not have to take that time to iron it down, to iron this, those edges in, you could do that as well. Not a problem there. So try it, try it, try it. You're not going to be wrong. Um, whatever you can do. So the other thing I was going to say is I had that quilt laid out and I would carry block. I would stack several up. Oh, that's what I was going to say. I'm losing my train of thought here. By one side being still the foam core board and the other side being batting, you can stack them up and it's not going to stick to the bottom of this. Okay, so don't be tempted to put flan or put uh, batting on both sides. You don't want to do that because then if you stacked them up, when you pick this one up, your fabrics from the one underneath are going to stick to that one. So you want one side to be that smooth side so that you can stack them up easily. So that quilt I would carry, I would put certain blocks on those and then carry them to the other room. The other thing you can do, and without showing you too much yet, the other thing you can do, um, this is all my so scrappy spools. This isn't all of them because I have some rows together so far. Um, and what I did is I laid this one out on our living room floor and then I stacked up all of row one and then all of row two, all of row three, and I had them stacked. This is about row five, and I need to write on this, but when I was downstairs uh, in our living room, I didn't. Um, but then I would stack all of those up, and you can see I just have the whole stack then sitting on a design board. What this keeps me from doing is losing some of the pieces on the bottom because they're sitting in a stack on my cutting table or something, and they get moved, and one doesn't go with it. When I pick up this whole stack, I'm taking that whole board with me. It keeps it from being flimsy, from just carrying that. It gives it some stability. And I just feel like I'm a little able to keep better track of all of these blocks by having them stacked up on a design board. Very simple, not a big deal, but um, just keeps me a little more organized. That's a good segue into So Scrappy Spools, you wanna see? So the last blocks were tulip blocks. I finished these um, within the last week or so, and I was so excited to go ahead and start putting the quilt together that I laid it all out, and, um, and now I'm starting to put the pieces together. I am so excited. You know the So Scrappy Spools is, has been a year-long quilt along with the Fat Quarter Shop. This is a pattern by Lori Holt but Fat Quarter Shop was sponsoring the quilt along. November was our last block to make and December is finishing it. So inside the pattern itself are the finishing instructions and that's all I brought with me today. Notice that all of the spools, you have one that's vertical, horizontal, vertical, horizontal, and those alternate throughout the quilt. Um, the problem was I did not discover that <laughs> or realize that some of those blocks needed to be oriented to that direction, how they were going to be put in the quilt. So some of my blocks, like all of my heart ones, I made vertical. Um, like, like that one's horizontal. That one's horizontal. Like this one. Okay, I made all of them vertical with the spools on the top and the bottom. Notice this heart block, though. When I created the block, I should have turned the heart sideways and put the, the spool ends on either side of it, and I did not do that. So I did not want to go back and correct those blocks. It's not a big deal. I'm not going to be storing the pattern with the quilt. Nobody is going to know that it should have been a different area in the block. Um, so it really doesn't matter. But I did need to move some blocks around because my heart one right here, I couldn't put that heart one right there because it need, whatever block this was needed to be ori oriented horizontally with the, um, with the spool ends on either side. So I did move some blocks around just here and there, nothing major. Um, a couple of the other blocks, um, like, this, like this one right here, these um, flying geese blocks, I made all four of mine with the arrows pointing up. So there was one, um, there was one that was on the edge of the quilt right here. So this one is on the edge of the quilt. Instead of swapping blocks out, 
on my quilt, I used this spool right here. I turned it the other direction, so my uh, flying geese are actually gonna be pointing um, off to the side and not straight up and down. To me, it wasn't, as, it wasn't that big a deal. It wasn't that big a deal. So I swapped some blocks. The other time that I would swap blocks around was if the spool ends were done in the same browns. So all of the blocks are separated. You don't have any two of the same block next to each other or even touching in any way. Most of the months that I was doing these, I did a different brown for each month, except a couple. <laughs> and there were a couple times where I did the same print for two months in a row or at least two months. But the problem came when I went to put those in the quilt, if they came up next to each other, to me it was kind of obvious that those spools were the same. The spool ends were the same brown, and I, re I just didn't want that. So I did swap a few blocks here and there, um, maybe just in a row or up and down, um, just so none of those spool ends were together. Now some of the prints were very, there were some that were just like obvious, so like this one. This one right here was a light enough brown that when it came up next to another one in the quilt, it was very obvious. Some of the others, they were a darker brown, and um, I think I ended up switching all of them that were next to another, but some of them it wasn't as noticeable if there were two beside each other, and I, I just didn't worry about that. So you do what's best for your quilt. Um, there are no quilt police. Nobody's going to say, look, you switched these blocks. It's just not a big deal. And um, I like the layout. The other reason that you might move some blocks around is for colorway. So mine is very scrappy. I did, because you have four of each block, usually, because you have four of each one, when I was picking some colors, so notice here, like her flying geese right here are orange. If I did a tulip that was orange as well, I wouldn't put it right next to my flying geese that were orange. I would try to space those colors out. Mine's very scrappy, so it's not, um, as, not as big a deal, but I do have a couple bright orange prints and I didn't want them all congregated in one spot and nothing down in, a, in another. So just when you're laying out your blocks, kind of, you know, if there's a bright orange print right here, then pick a different color tulip for that spot, just so it kind of lays it out. A hint that you can do with that, um, not so important in this quilt, I don't think, but if you're laying it out other quilts, is to lay out the quilt, take a picture, and um, almost everybody's taking pictures with their camera, and you can do this, with, uh, taking pictures with their phone, and you could do this with a regular camera as well, a nice camera, is to then switch it to monochrome. So edit your photo to go away from the color, to do it in black and white or monochrome. That shows you the, um, what do I want to say? It, it shows you the lights and darks. It, I can't think of the right word at this point. The tone of the quilt, or I guess the tones of the fabric, it takes away the color out of them, but um, it would show lights and darks and mediums in that. And you can very easily see then, oh, I've got all dark prints up here and all light prints down here. And if that's what you're after, that's fine. If you were wanting a more um, level quilt, level's not the right word, but um, you know, more even, a more even tone over the whole quilt, then I would just move some blocks Take the picture again, again switch it to the monochrome or the black and white so that you can see what those colors are doing. If all of the tone of all of the dark ones are in one spot, to me it just makes that side of the quilt very heavy, the other side very light. Sometimes designs, that's what you're after. Um, most of us are not doing quilts like that, we're doing more where we want an even feel over the whole quilt and that's just a trick that you can, you can use. So where I'm at with this one. I have got, let me see, I think I have four rows together. Now, in between each of the blocks, there is a sashing. So this is row one, and I did start with, you can see right away, I switched this block right here because I just said I did all of my flying geese um, up and down so you can tell I switched these two blocks because I was just showing you the pattern in the first 
the first block in the upper left hand corner was a tulip the second one was a flying geese and then the third one was this one and so i swapped these two out it didn't really matter okay um in between each block is a sashing piece and i am using for my sashing and for the border i'm using the same white print that i used in all of the spools this is blossom by christopher thompson this is the white white on white print I had a whole bolt of this, so it just made sense to go ahead and use that in for um, all the sashing and for the borders. There are five and a half inch borders that go around the entire outside of the quilt. So what I have done is I cut sashings. So next to my sewing machine, I have this stack. This is the next row. Um, because this is the first one, I will pin this one to it and I will number it, and the first one I didn't, I just put a pin in there, so I knew that was the upper left-hand corner. Let me show you just real quick. So here's row two, and I just wrote my number on that sticky note, and then pinned it, because those sticky notes don't stick <laughs> to fabric. Um, so I wrote a two on there, just stuck a little pin in it, so that I, and I always do it at the left-hand side, so it's always going left to right, and I know that this is the way it goes in the quilt. This is left to right. I always put my tag on the left-hand side of the quilt. And so that's how I numbered them. I've got some other fancier stickers. I have some little paper clip things with things. I was downstairs and I just grabbed some sticky notes and stuck it to it. So row five, I think this one is. I'll pin it to that. I would pick up this block here and I would pick up one of the sashings, and I would, I'm a pinner, so I would pick this up. Now I just dropped my sticky note. All right, I would leave my sticky note on there so that I know this needs to go on this side of it. I would pin the top and the bottom. This one I really didn't feel there's any need to pin the middle, but if, you, if you're afraid you're gonna push too much fabric as you're stitching, you can obviously pin in the middle as well. But I take this sashing strip. You know what? I have these handy little boards here. Wouldn't it be nice to do put it on that for you? Okay, so I would pick this first block up. I would pick up one of the sashing strips, it, and I would pin this on, and I would run it through. I do not use anything in between. I would pick up the next block. I have to be very careful because I don't want to mess these up. I would pick up the next block, another sashing strip, and I would run that one through the sewing machine right after the first one. I am chain piecing every one of these in the row until I get to the last block. And let me set this down here because I don't want to get these out of order. Until I get to the last block because there are seven. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. The last one does not need a sashing on its right hand side. So I pick up the first block and a sashing, second block and a sashing, third block and a sashing, and I just do each one until I get to the last one. I would just set that one off to the side. I now know I'm at the next row because I've got a blue sticky note there, so I stop, okay? Then I take these first two blocks off of front, you know, I reach behind my sewing machine, I clip these first two blocks, and I immediately flip the second one over on top of the, of the uh, first one. And I'm stitching what then would be the edge of this block with the sashing of that one. And I run those two. I grab the next two off the back of the sewing machine, run those through. The next two off the back of the sewing machine and run those through. Okay. And now I'm not ready to do this one yet because I've got groups of two now. So now I take this group off the back, this group off the back, and I join those. So now I have four. And then I grab this third group and I grab the last spool and I attach that to the end of that one, okay? This is all done chain piecing. I'm not doing a leader and ender. I'm not putting through you know, a bonus project, anything like this. This is just one right after the other until I attach that last spool to that one. Now, all the pieces that I need to put together are on the back of the machine. And I need this one too, because now I've got a set of four and a set of three. I need both of those pieces. That's when I'll pick up a couple pieces of fabric for a leader and ender project and run that through. I could 
if I was very organized, I could pick up the block one of the next row and attach it sashing and do that, then pull off this whole row, attach it. I could. I don't because I want a direct separation between that row and before I start the next one. That's just me. Um, I just like that concrete evidence that I'm at the, I'm finished with that row. Um, so I pull that one off and then that whole row is together. And that's what I have here. So here's row two. I guess I didn't show you all of row one. Row one. No sashing at the end. No sashing at either end. It doesn't need sashing on those. All right. <clears throat> Row two. I just love the scrappiness. I love it. Even that print right there that's a little brighter than I normally do, but it just works with all these scrappy things. I don't know. It almost looks like a little fireplace or something. <laughs> All right, and so I'm just working through the rows. Here is row three. You can see how I've attached the note with a pen and written on it. Love the flag blocks. And I did orient that flag block because I was alerted to the fact by that time that there were um, some horizontal blocks, and so I did make that one horizontal. There's one of my tulip blocks. You saw the red one a minute ago. There's my bright orange one. Love it. You know what? I want to show you real quick. One of my favorite blocks. It's one, it's the simple, and not this one, but it's the strips. And I know there's this one here, but it's, it's vertical in the quilt. And I almost like the ones that are horizontal. Let me see if I can find one. All right, when I find it, I'll show you. Anyway, this is um, row four, and this is the one that just came off the sewing machine. I like that block too. And there's row four. Now, I still have like I said, I just pulled this off the sewing machine, so I even still have my pins. I do sew right over my pins. Um, occasionally I've had one break. I probably know it's not best for my sewing machine. I work on an old Bernina that I have had for probably 15 years and I bought it used. <laughs> um, it does bend the pins sometimes. I, I know, I know, I know. It's probably not the best, but I like my pins in there. <laughs> I like it to stay in place. Um, and that's just the way I sew. I don't, don't follow me on that, I guess, because I know it may not be the best. And if I had um, you know, a featherweight, if I had, was working on an antique sewing machine, I don't know, I may not do that. I may have to find a better way. Um, but I like for my pieces to stay in place. And um, so that's why I pin. So. When this comes off the sewing machine, then I would pull all my pins out. Sometimes I pull them out ahead of time, but these I see are all still in there. So you can tell where I joined. That's where I joined those two blocks. Um, well then, okay, so I joined those two blocks and I joined these two blocks, but when I went to put those two sets together, I just pulled the pins out from one of those sets and, and used it for the next one. So that's row four. So that's all I have done at this point. And the rest is sitting here, ready to be done. Now, there is some sashing underneath the blocks. And notice that's where you attach the cornerstones. So there's this little colored, I'm doing mine all scrappy. You saw the quilt last week um, where Lisa did blue in all of those. A great option there. Excuse me. So what I am doing with these, I mentioned that I've cut all my sashings, and so I still, you know, I, I actually I started these, the, the long strips. Um, I did quite a few before I started on the blocks, and then I was kind of getting bored with that, so I went to the blocks. But I cut all my sashings, and I have those sitting next to my um, sewing machine. I would pick up a sashing, and I would pick up a little um, square. 
I have muffin tins sitting next to my sewing machine that have these little one and a half inch squares because I use them as leaders and enders for um, the Chex Mix block. And I would just, so I would do them one at a time, like here, okay? Do a bunch of those, and I pull those off the back of the machine, and I would just grab a couple. It's like, okay, here's an orange one, here's a gray one. Those would be good, side by side. And then I join those, you know, and pick up two more. And then I join some of those together. And I'm not trying to be, um, to plan this at all. I'm just, and then I'll lay it out eventually, and um, with the rows of the spools, Obviously, I need more on this one. There is white at either end, so I need one, two, three, four, five, six, and then a white at the very end. So right now I have four. So I just need to attach a section, two more, and then do a white one at the end, and that would be long enough. And then I'll lay out my rows. Once those are done, I'll lay out these strips. Once those are done, obviously everything needs to be pressed before then I put those together. Um, but then I can lay it out to see if I like the color placement of these. And that's where I'm at. I'm so excited. I really, really, really am excited. Um, you kind of forget all the blocks that you made. And then when I had this laid out the other night and I'm, you know, I had, I had all my heart blocks here and all the star blocks here and all the log cabin blocks here. And so I had them in different piles and I would look at the pattern and I would pick up one of those and I would set it down. And, oh, I was just getting so excited. It was so so pretty. So I'm really excited to get this all together and to keep showing you progress on this. I have no idea what pantograph I'll use. I don't have a backing fabric picked out yet at all. Um, all things I need to start thinking about, I guess. Um, but that's where I'm at right now with So Scrappy Spools. So excited. All right, I think that's all of the things I have for my own um, sewing this week. So how about we move on to some customer quilts? So this week I have five customer quilts. Um, I just, this past weekend, since um, we had family coming in um, and we've had a lot of activities over the weekend, I just gave myself permission to not do any, any long arm quilting over the weekend. I normally do um, because with the machine being inside my home, I can start it and I can um, get a pantograph going and then I can run and do something else. I can come back and I can keep a good eye on the machine at all times. Um, I did work a little bit late in on Friday evening. And then once uh, our son got home from college, it was probably 10 o'clock, Friday night, 11 o'clock. I don't know. It was kind of late. Um, so we went to bed late that night. We had other activities on Saturday. I did do some of my own personal sewing on Saturday, but just gave myself permission to have a couple days off from long arm quilting. So um, I'm getting real close on getting everybody's Christmas stuff done, and that'll be out in the next week or so. But uh, sometimes we just need that mental space, and I just needed that mental space this weekend just to, um, we went to bed late. We have been to bed late almost every night, and then back up and activities going on. And um, it was just good. It was a, a good time. I was home by myself for a short amount of time. Uh, hunting season also started this past weekend. So a couple of them were out doing that. And so um, I did have some time to myself and I just decided I just need some time just to do some sewing. And um, I don't wanna be one of the long arm quilters that never has time for my own projects. So I try to always have something ready to show you each week that I'm working on because that keeps me accountable that I'm doing something of my own as well. And I hope you understand that. Um, I know I have deadlines and, I'm, and I will get my deadlines done, um, but it was just a good weekend. I hope you'll take some time, maybe over this Thanksgiving holiday, um, just to pull back some and just to enjoy, uh, 
if you don't get it all the time during the week, maybe you're one that's home all the time during the week and then um, you're enjoying that family time. I'm one of those that I've got a lot going on during the week and sometimes I just need that quiet time where it's just me to do some sewing. So I gave myself a little bit of permission to have a couple days off there um, after getting these beautiful quilts done and so excited. Back at it today, even I've got some quilts going or quilt going on the long arm earlier and I'll be getting back to that here in a little bit. But first, let's start with Shelly's quilt. Shelly is a Lori Holt fan. I've lost track how many quilts I've done of Shelly's. She is getting them out there. I am so impressed with her work. And this one is Farm Girl Vintage. This is from the book Farm Girl Vintage, and I will link that down below. I have never done this quilt, um, but absolutely love it love it and so this there are two ways in the book you can do the six inch squares you can do the 12 inch squares Shelly chose the six inch squares for this one she's used all um I believe it's all Lori Holt fabric I I can't um vouch for that it at least all matches I mean several of the prints that I know are Lori Holt others that I'm not quite sure of so it doesn't matter they all match it's all scrappy and these are, like I said, six inch blocks. They're all, um, some, they're all pieced. Nothing's applique on here, which is a, a fun thing to do. Lori does all of her block, her books are always pieced books. She doesn't do applique books. When she's doing an applique quilt, that's when she'll do the sew along guide and then you follow along on her, on her uh, blog. <laughs> that was a funny way to put those together. Um, you follow along on her blog and she gives you how to do each one of those. So this is all pieced, her Farm Girl Vintage book. There is a Farm Girl Vintage 2 book as well. Such cute blocks. I mean, you've got houses and teapots and canning jars. And um, the pumpkin, the scrappy pumpkin is really cute too. And the barn, the chick with the little heart. And then you have some more traditional blocks. There's some pinwheels and some stars. Um, a good mix in here. Love the hen as well. And the spools are really pretty. Just so much to look at and see. Here's a, a leaf block, a scrappy leaf. Isn't that cute? Just a really fun. Here's a strawberry. Try not to go too fast so you can get a look at some of these. Um, there was a sheep. Did I show you the sheep? I know he was off to the edge. Oh, I <laughs> missed these two. The pears, I think those are really adorable. And look at her little sheep. I love his pink face and his gray body, little speckled body. She has done some embroidery. Um, you can see for the legs, um, for the eyes on different things, just stitched little stitches of embroidery. Um, there, the legs on that one. Little stitches done, and that's a nice thing. I, I, I've i mentioned in the past that I like to do my embroidery prior to the long arm quilting, but any embellishments such as buttons and things like that need to be done afterwards. Uh, I can't sew around buttons or over the top of them, but the embroidery just is fine. Love the milk can. So six inch blocks, you do have sashing in between all of these, just very similar to the so scrappy spools with the uh, cornerstones, all scrappy cornerstones. And then she has done a red border, just a solid red, looks like a, a Kona red or something like that. The backing is the same, she's done a red backing. She did do, this is really cute, she did a strip across the back and she put a label in the middle and then she will add in you know right on there with a micron pen or whatever the the label that was a really cute effect then you can see very well on this red you can see we use the easy Baptist fan for the pantograph I just told Shelly I said this is feels very um, you know, farm girl kind of vintage, and so you can't get much more vintage than a Baptist fan. And this is done in a white thread on the front and the back, so it shows up very well on the back. But um, with the white solids for all of the sashing and for the block work, 
felt white was the best option. So, so cute. And this would be really cute with a scrappy binding as well. Kind of pull from all those scrappy fabrics in the middle. Really, really cute, Shelly. Love that. And I have had the pleasure this week of having a second Lori Holt pattern in the studio. So here are some pictures of this quilt. This one is Joanne's quilt, and this is the B Vintage quilt. This is also a Lori Holt pattern, but this one is all applique. So I love these big, um, the big applique. So many of Lori's are the real small, like my Calico Garden. This one, everything is big, and it's just super cute. I mean, you can't get much cuter than that. That gingham Scotty dog with his uh, little bandana around there. So for this pattern, I have linked um, down below. There is a whole kit you can buy from the Fat Quarter Shop. It includes all of the fabrics that you need. It does have a printout of the Sew Along Guide, which is in a super nice color quality. It's, it's better than you can print off on your printer. Um, I really like it. The thing and it includes the binding fabric. It does not include your backing fabric and it does not include the so simple shapes. So I will link the so simple shapes in there as well if that's all you're needing. Because you can, if you're going to use your own fabrics, um, the sew along guide is free on Lori's website. So or on her blog. So if you're going to use your own fabrics and don't need the whole kit. The only thing you need to buy is the so Simple Shapes, and so I'll link those separately. If you're buying the kit, then there's also an option when you buy the kit, then it'll say additional add-ons, and you'll want to add in the so Simple Shapes if you don't already have them. So the kit includes the Sew Along Guide, all the fabrics for the front, and the binding fabric. So um, you still need your so Along, your so Simple Shapes, and your backing fabric. But this very well could be done from things from your stash where all you needed was the so simple shapes. And then to know how to put all of the pieces together is where you need to follow along on Lori's blog. You can go in and search for Be Vintage, or if you could go down the side, if you know what months she did this, this was earlier this year. So if you go down the months on the side of it, um, so it was after Calico Garden, but it's already done. So it would start, it would have started in the summertime at some point. Um, but you can go along that and then follow along by the dates as well. So this one has a little bit different sashing or, or uh, setting is what I meant to say. These blocks, um, I didn't measure them prior to, but it looks about like a 10 inch block. Then you have the sashing in it is a double, uh, what you could say a triple. I meant double because it's two different fabrics. Really cute, done in strips. So you have the top and the bottom in the middle um, and then with a darker cornerstone on each one. Really like that. Love the house. Looks like a little cottage. Um, what other blocks? Of course, a sunbonnet Sue, and she has her little flower. I like this block. I like this one. This is all um, applique. Like I said, all of these are applique, but I really like these. This reminds me, if you did the My Happy Place quilt, and there was one block in that that was uh, supposed to mimic fat quarters laid out like on the diagonal and overlapping each other. That's very similar to what this reminds me of how they're overlapped, but it's just a super cute block. That would be um, really fun just to do that in a whole big setting all by itself. And obviously that could be done. You could take any one of these and, I, and Lori talks about that. You could take any one of these blocks and repeat it for the entire amount of the quilt and have a beautiful quilt. So the whole Sunbonnet Sioux quilt, obviously you've seen those in the past. Um, a whole flower quilt. There's the cherries. Um, there's a bird, a leaf, so many. 
This quilt measures 71 by 85. There's a butterfly, so if you have somebody in your life that loves butterflies, you could do a whole quilt with just that, all different colored butterflies. You can see um, how Joanne has done the, um, like a chain stitch there for her embroidery. I'm thinking, oh, that is there. There's also some embroidery on the cat. Now, she has not done eyes on the cat, so I'm assuming what she's gonna do is put buttons on that for the cat, and like I said earlier, I that can't be put on prior to long arm quilting. And the cat with his great big old pink bow. And uh, overall Sam, the umbrella. The umbrella already has the rickrack and I can certainly long arm quilt over rickrack. No problem with that one. Then you can see the large border she put around the edges. And then the backing. It also has the large cornerstones, which is really cute because it's the same fabric. You've got the small cornerstones in the whole big setting, but then um, the border has a cornerstone on each corner. Really cute. And this is her backing fabric. This was a nice thing because the front of it, you know, you have the big blocks in the front and a lot of the dark border. And then again, switching it up to the same colors, but with the white background and the blue print on top of that. Really pretty. So the pantograph we chose for this one is called Daisy Delight. And we did this in a white thread as well. I think it may be easiest to see there. You can see the pretty big petal. Joanne asked for something flowers, so I sent her several different choices and this is the one she went with. I like this. Six petal daisy there um, with that center circle. Really fun. It was so fun to have Lori Holt quilts in the studio this week. I enjoy it. And to have two different ones was a really fun too. One pieced and one applique. So you choose which one you um, would prefer to do or one of each, right? Really, really fun. All right, let's move on to this quilt right here. This is Rebecca's quilt, and um, Rebecca created this pattern on her own. She has her own YouTube channel, and I will link that down below where she has um, videos about how she constructed this and a PDF pattern that you can print off for free. So she's created this for her granddaughter, and uh, this is all done in art gallery fabrics. And I've mentioned before, art gallery fabrics just have a cool crispness. There's something about their fabrics that are just, um, just a different feel than others. And uh, if you know Art Gallery, very bright fabrics, very whimsical a lot of times, um, very, um, a little more modern, a little more pushing the edge of things and the colorways and the designs. It's a really, a really fun um, um, fabric produce. Oh, I don't know what you call them. <laughs> A really fun company. So the the neat thing about this is, uh, let me tell you about the fabrics. The fabrics are called Flower Child by Maureen Cracknell, and that is done for art gallery fabrics. So Rebecca has created this pattern where she, um, this is not, uh, she says you could use a panel for this. This piece is actually not from a panel, I believe that it is um, fussy cut from a large print yardage or, or um, fabric. So originally I thought it was a panel, but I can see you know, a little bit of the edge over here that might fit in over here, a little bit of this green where I think that might be another part. Um, I could not find a large enough piece of this fabric to know whether it was actually a panel where you're cutting around the squares or whether it was just, my assumption is, my feeling from looking at it, is that it is um, a large print fabric and then she fussy cut these squares out. Probably 10 inch squares, maybe 12. I don't know, you'll have to go look at her um, YouTube and the pattern to figure that out. 
And this is really cute. I love how she's done this. Now, this flying geese here, um, the strips down the side, these little uh, diamonds, those are actually applique onto um, the, the, um, the larger block afterwards. Really cute. So you can do the long strips there and not have to worry about you know, piecing that in. It's just very easily done with applique. This is the backing fabric. Very nice, really cute. And then you can see the pantograph really easy. Rebecca asked for the, the rainbow hearts. Um, and we did this in the, in the white thread. Really cute. Won't that be cute for a granddaughter? How fun. Love the pinks and the purples, the mint greens, just like an enchanted forest. And that's what Rebecca called the pattern. She called it um, Enchanted Meadow is the name of the pattern. And these are the flower child fabrics. Really cute. You have to check that out. All right, let's move on to a Christmas quilt. Lynn's Christmas quilt is so cute. This pattern is called Christmas at the Cabin, and this is a Coach House Designs pattern. All of the fabrics in this are from Deb Strain. This is her Holiday Lodge pat or a fabric line. That's an older line, well, but done several years ago. Um, you may be able to find some of those, but she has a new one out right now called Holidays at Home, and I think it would work just as well. There's a lot of the same, very similar type prints. I think you could do the same... Um, the same quilt with that line. Some of this is pieced and some of it is appliqued. So on like this cabin here, um, all of the windows, the um, kind of look like porch railings, that's all pieced. The windows, the door is all pieced. But this um, wreath right here, that is appliqued. And actually the roof right here is also appliqued. So at some point, behind this this has to be done somehow because <laughs> this part is pieced but this is appliqued down on top on top of there so you won't have to worry about the the diagonal piecing at that point the merry christmas letters those are all appliqued as well each one individual and um lynn did applique with um matching color thread so all of the letters have um, either red or green thread around them. The wreath had black. This one, like I said, the, it's on, this must be needle turned applique. Because I can't see, it's not machine. So this right here looks like it's needle turned applique. Um, because I cannot see the stitches at all. But it feels applique. It doesn't feel pieced, huh? Um, but then the rest of this is machine. Actually, this is machine, the wreath is machine er, applique, but then the animals at the bottom, this deer, look at that. It is not machine, that is hand applique down. Very tiny stitches, I cannot see. She has done such a nice job. I cannot see the threads on that at all. It's all hand applique. With the, with the stitches hidden beneath. beneath. So that's appliqued and the bear as well. Hand appliqued, isn't that cute? Everything else is pieced, the trees are pieced, the stars are pieced. Um, again, trees. I think this has gotta be five weeks in a row I've had some sort of a tree quilt. <laughs> and they're really pretty. Love these fabrics. And again, her the Deb Strain line, um, newest line would work really well for this as well. The borders, red and then a black. This is a like a wood grain border, very similar to the same one as done on the cabin. And then that border's really pretty. 
So all cottons on the front. Let me check. Yes, all cottons on the front. I was making sure those animals were, were cotton. But on the back, we have a flannel. This plaid flannel, red and black and gray. Really pretty. Oh my goodness. Pantograph. Um, let me look real quick at uh, Lynn's. She had, out, she had sent me a couple um, suggestions, and one of them was a diagonal plaid, and I'm like, hands down, I think the diagonal plaid, I never get tired of this one. Um, woodsy, flannel, I, I just, uh, the plaid look, I just think this is just so classy. And this is um, a white thread because of all the white background fabric. I love that. I love that. <laughs> Very pretty Christmas quilt. Really fun. Then I have one more of Lynn's down here at the bottom. second quilt is the pattern star patch and this is a Missouri star pattern and this is done with a roll of two and a half inch um, strips and um, Lynn chose the Auber Aubergine Lynn chose the um, and for the fabrics Lynn chose the Aubergine by Debbie Beeves for the fabric line and then just a white um, background for all of that so it says let me find i don't have the dimensions of the pattern here in front of me the quilt that i have right here is 78 by 88 so you'll need to check the pattern if that's the size of the pattern i don't have that pulled up right here um, it shows four and a half yards of background fabric one and a half yards of a complementary fabric let's see where that might and then it's the two and a half inch. So um, I don't know if the complementary fabric is what you're using here on uh, for all the stars. Perhaps that's it. Because all of the stars have the same, um, that same purple fabric is on all of them. So maybe that's the complementary fabric that they talk about. And then a roll of two and a half inch strips and then four and a half inch four and a half yards of the background fabric. Looks like a fairly simple quilt. You know, you got your four patch and your star and you're alternating those. Love the setting, how the um, little, you know, not everything's right up next to each other. We've got a lot of white space, which is really pretty. Now the border, I like the border too. Two and a half inch squares all the way around. I like that. I like that. A different piece border is always fun. I like that. All right, backing fabric. Again, cotton's on the front and we have a flannel print on the back. Um, this appears to be one of the primitive gatherings flannels. I don't have that information for sure, but that's what it looks like to me. So super soft. I like that combination of cotton on the front and flannel on the back. Love the purple, the plum. And you can see the pantograph. This is the knit one, pearl one. Pantograph, we did this in white to match all the white background fabric on the front. And I, oh, another one of my favorite pantographs. I don't know, kind of like kids. I can't say my favorite, but I love them all. Oh my goodness. So, so pretty. Very nice. Very nice. So those are the customer quilts I have for this week. I hope you are making lots of time to quilt and that you'll have some time this weekend, maybe over Thanksgiving holiday here in the U.S. I know I have lots of viewers from around the world, and we are so glad you are here as well. So um, like I usually say or always say, every quilt is worth finishing. So if you're working on your first quilt, make sure you finish it. Don't stick it away in the, in the closet and think it's not good enough. It's part of your journey and you need to finish it, whether it's your grandmother's 
quilt top that you find in a cedar chest, let's pull it out and get it done. Or maybe this is your hundredth quilt and you're just still moving along and, and getting those turned out and uh, everyone is worth finishing. So have a happy Thanksgiving and we will see you back here next week.